Hey, not a funny way, that sounds irreverent. Has a unique way of reminding us of his providence and his sovereignty over all things. Uh, when we invited the team, we did not tell them uh, which songs to play. Uh, we didn't tell them which songs we wanted to go where. Uh, but when, in communication with them, they sent us the list of songs, Cornerstone happened to be the song that was going to be slotted right before I preached. And I can't think of a better song, a better hymn, that would lead us to our passage this morning in Mark chapter 4, where Jesus calms a stormy sea. Mark chapter 4, please turn with me in your Bibles. Uh, If you have a hard copy or turn on your screen or whatever it may be in your digital copy to God's Word, Mark chapter 4, we're going to read A shorter section this morning, verses 35 to the end of the chapter, verse 41, and then we will consider the Lord's word this morning. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35, this is what Holy Scripture says to us today. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with him in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray. God in heaven, we come before you today as a needy people. We need you to feed us. We need you to give us this life-giving bread that only comes from you. And so we ask today as we come to your word that we would be fed. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Give us hearts to receive and hearts to be obedient. We pray for the children downstairs and we ask that you would, you would work in and through the teachers this morning as they present your word to the children. And we pray that the word that is preached downstairs and the word that is preached up here would cause all of us to give praise and glory and honor to Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. In 2008, 14-year-old Emily Stauffer was attacked and killed just outside of her home as she was out for a walk. Her and her family lived in Edmonton. Her dad was a pastor. And as I read his blog about what happened to their family, losing Emily, he wrote about the overwhelming sense of hurt and loss because of her death. I never met her dad, whose name was Terry, but I did have the privilege of knowing Terry's son, Emily's older brother, Josh. Josh and I went to Toronto Baptist Seminary together uh, about a decade ago. He was a quiet guy, brilliant guy. Uh, He understood languages and linguistics better than anybody I've ever known. Like, he just understood Greek. You know the phrase, it's all Greek to me? Not true with him. He just got it just like that. He was a brilliant guy, um, but quiet. And he didn't talk much about what happened to his family or to his sister. Josh and I lost touch after seminary. I got married and moved to Guelph, and he got married and moved to Quebec and started serving a church there. In 2019, at the age of 27... Josh died because of an aneurysm in his heart. He was out celebrating his birthday with his wife, 
And later that night when he went to sleep, he had an aneurysm and just never woke up. Not only was it his birthday, but he and his wife were expecting their first child about a month later. To say that this family had experienced trial and tribulation, sorrow and sadness would seem a little bit of an understatement. It's hard to trust God in those moments, isn't it? To trust God in that moment of despair and sorrow. It's hard to trust him in the middle of the storm. When we feel lost and hopeless, abandoned, like nothing is going the way that it should. What do we do? We cry out to God in our sorrow, God, where are you? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to us? Jesus, where are you? Why don't I see you? Why don't I feel you? What do we do when we experience the loss of loved ones? When we hear that the cancer is back, when we lose our financial security or our home, when we lose lose every sense of stability that we have in this life, what do we do? When that sickness or disease won't go away, when when life is just one continual wave after another. We're faced with the question, will you trust God in that moment or will you not? Will you put your hope in him or will you not? Will you cling to him in the middle of the storm or will you not? Our passage this morning gives us three reasons why we should trust God in the middle of the storm. Three exhortations, three explanations, three justifications for why we ought to put our hope and faith and trust in Jesus, even though there's a storm raging around us. Let me give you these three things and then we'll work through them together. We should trust Jesus because of first, his plan, second, his presence, and third, his power. We should trust Jesus because of his plan, his presence, and his power. We should trust Jesus because of his plan for the storm. There's no such thing as an insignificant detail in the Bible. There's nothing that is too small, too trivial, too unimportant in the Bible. When Paul says that all scripture is God-breathed, he means exactly that, all of scripture, even the little details, even the little things that we so often miss and ignore. And Mark has given us a lot of details. If we look in verse 35, he gives us a lot of details that describe the setting of what's going on. He tells us what day it is. It's the same day, on that day, he says. That day that began at the beginning of chapter four, that day where Jesus was out on the boat, teaching in parables to people on the shore. He tells us what time of day it is. He tells us that it's evening. He tells us that it's getting darker, that it's becoming harder to see. The light is beginning to fade. He gives us the location, where they are. They're on the Sea of Galilee, still, just as he was, sitting on the boat. And he tells us what they're doing. They're going across to the other side. He also tells us who was there. There was Jesus and the disciples in the boat, and there were other people, others with them in other boats. What do these details tell us? They tell us a number of things. We could discern multiple points from what's going on here, but I want to draw your attention to just one, which is this. Jesus wanted to be on the lake that evening. They weren't caught in the storm by accident. It didn't happen because of bad luck that they started to row across the lake and then the storm hit. They were out on the lake that evening because of Jesus' intentions, because he wanted to be there. Verse 35 tells us that it was Jesus' idea to cross the lake that evening. Let us go across to the other side, he says. But if they go across, as Jesus has suggested, that means that they're not going around the lake on foot. I know that may just sound obvious, but just stick with me for a moment and track with me here. If they go across instead of going around, it means they're going to bypass a number of villages that are scattered across the shore. We know that Jesus told us back in chapter one, the whole reason I came out, the whole reason I've appeared, the whole reason I'm here is to preach the gospel, to preach the good news. So why would Jesus pass up more opportunities to preach the gospel? 
Why would he bypass these villages and towns? And why would he willingly leave the crowd behind and cross the lake? Because Jesus had a purpose. He had a reason. He had a plan for being on the lake that evening. It will become obvious as we move into chapter five, Lord willing, what we'll look at next week, that Jesus had a purpose with the destination. He had somewhere to be. He had somewhere to go. He wanted to go to the country of the Gerasenes. And we'll look at that next week. He had important business. But Jesus also had a specific purpose for the journey, for the process of getting across the lake. They could have gone around by foot. They could have gone ashore and rested before they left, but they left just as they were. They could have waited until the next day instead of traveling by night when it's dark and hard to see. It would have been easier to cross if they had waited. But Jesus had a purpose. They weren't out there by accident. Jesus wanted to be on the lake that evening because he intended to reveal more of himself to his disciples. The storm was going to be a means to an end, a tool in the hands of Jesus so that his disciples might see more of who Jesus is. Jesus was going to pull back the veil a little bit, reveal just a little bit more about who he was. But Jesus also wanted to be on the lake that evening in the middle of the storm to show his disciples of their great need of him. They had witnessed many miracles already, right? As we've walked through the first couple of chapters of the Gospel of Mark, what have the disciples witnessed? They've seen Jesus heal people with fevers and on various kinds of diseases and sicknesses. We've seen Jesus cast out demons. We've seen Jesus teach with a power and authority that no other human being has ever had before. The disciples have seen the needs of other people met in ways that nobody could have ever imagined. And yet, what they had not personally experienced yet was their specific need of him. Yes, they had called, they had responded to the call of Jesus to come follow him, but they hadn't fully grasped how much they needed him. The disciples find themselves in a position where they are powerless to stop the storm. They're even powerless to get out of it. They're reminded that they can't do anything on their own. They need Jesus. They need to run to him. Or in this case, they need to stumble their way to the back of the boat where Jesus is sleeping and they need to cry out to him for help. They come to Jesus filled with fear and worry and doubt, but they cry out to him. It's doubtful that they had the right attitudes when they came to Jesus. The the language here seems to indicate that they almost have some sort of rebuke in their voice. Jesus, don't you care? Jesus, what's wrong with you? Why are you sleeping? The disciples obviously don't have perfect hearts, but they did the only thing they could do in a moment of crisis, in a moment where all hope had faded, where no power was left in their arms. They go to Jesus. Why should we trust Jesus in the middle of the storm? Because the storm is where God reveals himself to his people. Where God shows himself to be provider and protector. Where God displays his mighty power as savior and sustainer. The storm is where we learn to lean on Jesus. When all our hope is gone, when we can't escape the storm or cause it to stop, that's when we see our greatest need of him. That's when we're forced, out of all other options, we must go to Jesus. That hymn that we sang earlier, when darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in, the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. 
We should trust Jesus because he has a plan for this storm, because he has a plan for us in the middle of these things. It's not by accident. Secondly, we should trust Jesus because of his presence in the storm, his presence with his people, with his disciples in the middle of that storm. They're not alone. Storms were pretty common on the Sea of Galilee. It was surrounded by by mountains and hilly ranges on most points. And when the cold air that came down from the mountains mixed with the warm air of the sea, it would create these violent, turbulent, almost hurricane-like storms out on the Lake of Galilee. And this appears to be one of those hurricane-like storms. The disciples are terrified. They're afraid. They are worried, terrified. They just seem like too small of words to describe what's going on with these disciples. Even the four seasoned fishermen, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, are, are terrified. This should tell us something about the intensity of the storm, right? When the tax collector on the boat is afraid of the storm, we don't really give a second thought. He has no idea what he's getting into anyways. He doesn't live on the water. He doesn't make his living on the sea. That's not his realm of expertise. When the bookworm is out on the ocean and is afraid of the storm, it's not a big deal. But when the four men who made their living on the water, who are fishermen by trade, when they are terrified by the sea, That tells us something about the severity of what's going on. They're afraid because they believe they're staring death in the face. Because they're powerless to stop the storm. Hopelessly tossed around by the wind and the waves. They're afraid because they think their lives are in the hand of nature. And these fears cause them to make a false assumption about Jesus. They jump to a conclusion that just simply isn't true. They assume that because Jesus is asleep at the back of the boat, that means he doesn't care about them. Look in verse 38. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you care that we're being crushed by the waves? Don't you care that we are being pummeled by the wind? Don't you care that we are going to die? Don't you care at all, Jesus? How can you sleep? Why was Jesus asleep? How could he actually sleep with this giant torrential storm raging around him? How is that even possible? Well, for starters, why does anybody sleep? We sleep because we're tired. We sleep because we're exhausted. And Jesus, being truly human, experienced exhaustion just like every other human being. Remember, details are important. What has Mark told us at the beginning of this section? Jesus has been teaching on a boat, exposed to the elements all day. He's been giving it all for the sake of the gospel. He's been preaching, pouring in everything that he has for the sake of teaching the message of the kingdom. And now, he's tired. There's a reason most pastors nap on Sunday afternoons. Because giving it all for the sake of the gospel is exhausting. It's worth it, but it's exhausting. Jesus sleeps because he's tired, but, but it's deeper than that. There's more than that. He doesn't just sleep because he's tired, although that's likely true. He sleeps because he doesn't fear the storm. He's not afraid of what's going on around him. He doesn't fear what the storm can bring. He doesn't fear death, and that's why he can sleep. Anybody here um, hate spiders? <laughs> like, like, just absolutely, they are the give you the heebie-jeebies, like they are the creepiest little things out there. Candace absolutely hates spiders. More specifically, she hates spiders in our house. And very specifically, she hates spiders in our bedroom, in our house. That is uh, a no-go, a big uh, no way Jose. And she cannot sleep if there is a spider in our bedroom. Even if she saw it like earlier that day and it disappeared somewhere, that almost makes it worse because she has no idea where it is. And because she can't sleep because there's a spider in the room, you know what that means? It means I'm not allowed to sleep. I'm not allowed to go to sleep until that spider is dealt with, until it's either found or chased out of the room somewhere. Jesus faces something far more intimidating, far more fearful than a spider. And yet he still sleeps because he's not worried about facing death. 
He has complete trust, complete confidence in God, and so should his disciples. Jesus will turn to his disciples after rebuking the sea and rebuking the wind, and he will rebuke them. He will say in verse 40, have you still no faith? It may seem a little harsh for Jesus to rebuke his disciples this way when they were just experiencing a storm. Why would Jesus rebuke them for being afraid? The storm was raging around them. How could Jesus be so insensitive? Jesus rebukes them because they have no reason whatsoever to be afraid in the middle of the storm because Jesus is there with them. Jesus isn't saying the storm is real, isn't real. He's not saying anything like that. You know like when a, when a parent tries to convince their kid that the monster in the closet isn't real? It's not real. Just stop being afraid and go to sleep. Jesus isn't saying that. He's not saying that it's not a big deal, like I do with Candace when there's a spider in the room. It's not a big deal. We'll worry about it later. Jesus isn't saying that at all. The storm is real. The storm is serious. The storm is dangerous. The storm is scary, but this, the disciples have no reason to fear this very real, life-threatening storm because Jesus is there in the boat with them. Jesus is teaching them and us that fear and faith cannot coexist. They're inconsistent, incompatible. They don't go together with one another. To be with Jesus to have Jesus in the boat, to have Jesus with you in life means there is no fear of death. There is no fear of the storm. Jesus told his disciples that he would be with them to the very end of the age, at the end of Matthew's gospel. Go, make disciples, baptize, grow the church, and I'll, I'll be with you every step of the way. And that promise is true for all of his disciples, including you and me. He was with Paul, the apostle, when he was shipwrecked. He was with Peter when he was captured and thrown in prison. And he's with us when we lose our jobs or our home. He's with us when, we, when a loved one passes away or some other type of tragedy hits our lives. He is with every single person who has put their faith and hope and trust in him. He's with us in the middle of the storm. That means we don't have to be afraid of the storm. Not because it's not real, but because he's with us in the middle of it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. The disciples were safer with Jesus in that boat, in the valley of death, in the valley of the shadow of death. They were safer there than if they were at home in bed on their own without Jesus. They were safer in that boat in the middle of the storm, more secure in the hands of Jesus than even the most powerful king barricaded up in his fortress. We should trust Jesus because of his presence in the storm with us. Thirdly, we should trust Jesus because of his power over the storm. Can you put yourselves in the place of the disciples that evening? Put yourself in their shoes, so to speak, or sandals, I guess. They probably didn't wear shoes like we wear, but put yourself in their sandals. Can you imagine what it would have been like that evening? Like actually just for a moment, pretend like you haven't heard this story a thousand times in Sunday school and just like you're hearing it for the first time and you try to imagine what were they thinking and feeling. The wind is cold and biting. It causes you to lose the feeling in your fingertips because of how cold the water and the wind is on your body. The wind is is blowing not just the waves against the boat, it's rocking the boat and it's hitting you as well. It's hard for you to stay on your feet. The waves are crashing over the side of the boat and you're, you're soaked to the bone, you're cold. Have you ever been so cold where you just have the uncontrollable shakes? Like there's just, you, you can't stop? 
you can't see because it's dark. Now there's a storm that's covering the sky, but the wind is also blasting those waves, blasting the water into your face, getting hit with the, those little minute pellets of water as it hits you in the face. You're, you're trying to squint even to just see what's going on around you. Four of you are in the middle of the boat where the oars were, and four of you are struggling to get out of the storm. They're struggling to row, to just get anywhere. It doesn't matter where. We don't care where we hit on the shore. Jesus had a particular place we're going. We don't care where that destination is anymore. We just want out of here. The rest of you are trying to bail the water out of the boat that keeps crashing in with whatever you've got, likely just your hands, just cupping water and trying to get it out of there so that your boat doesn't capsize or sink. At some point, it dawns on you that there's no hope. At some point, it dawns on you that you're going to die. It dawns on you that there's nothing you can do to get out of the storm. And as you look around at the faces of your companions coming to this conclusion, you scan the back of the boat and you see something you were too busy to notice before. When a storm hits, you're not really looking at the back of the boat, you're looking at the wave and the storm and everything else that's going on around you. And you see Jesus asleep at the back of the boat. Perhaps you feel angry, at the very least frustrated that Jesus would be sleeping. Why isn't he helping? What in the world is he doing back there? Doesn't doesn't he know what's going on around him? Why isn't he doing anything to help? How can he sleep in the middle of the storm? Finally, one of you, or maybe all of you, stumble your way to the back of the boat and you wake Jesus up. You shake him awake because yelling probably won't do much with the wind and the waves and the crashing noise of everything going on around you. You have to physically grab onto Jesus and shake him awake. And when Jesus wakes up, There's no fear on his face. No panic in his voice as he stands up and simply says two words, three words in our English translations. He gets up and he says, peace, be still, silence, quiet. Or like I do with my kids sometimes when they're being a little bit too rambunctious, I say, that's enough. That's what Jesus says to the storm. That's enough. Silence. And what happens when Jesus speaks to the storm? What do the disciples observe going on around them when Jesus speaks? There's no struggle that takes place. There's no great battle between Jesus and nature. The storm simply stops. The disciples go from being surrounded by utter chaos and turmoil to being engulfed in immediate tranquility. All of a sudden, everything that caused them to worry and fear was gone. He doesn't use any incantations or spells. He doesn't have to exert any energy. He doesn't even have to lift a finger. He simply speaks. He gives a command and suddenly there is silence. The question is, why? Why was there silence after Jesus spoke? I speak all the time to my kids and I don't get results very often. How did Jesus get results? Why would the storm stop simply because he said a couple of words? How is that possible? And the disciples have the same question at the end of our section here in verse 34 or sorry, verse 41. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Why does the storm listen to Jesus? Because when Jesus speaks, God speaks. Because the wind and the sea don't hear the voice of any ordinary man that evening. The storm hears the voice of the creator and when the creator speaks, creation obeys. Jesus displays his mighty power over the wind and the sea, over the wind and the waves when he speaks. He displays a power that no ordinary man could possess. 
He displays an ability that only one being in the universe has, God himself. This is what we've seen over and over again as we've worked through the first couple of chapters of Mark's gospel. Jesus has been showing us that he's not just different than most people. He's not trying to say that he's simply more unique or more special or just slightly more important than everybody else on the planet. Jesus has been showing us, if we've been paying attention, if we have ears to hear, he's showing us that he's entirely different to every other being in the universe. He has an ability to heal the sick and cast out demons. He has an ability to preach and teach unlike anybody else has ever heard. He has the ability to forgive sins. And who can forgive sins but God alone, the Pharisees ask. One of the few times in the New Testament the Pharisees happen to be right. Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. Jesus displays a divine power and authority that evening on the lake, something that he was showing his disciples and us if we are willing to hear, if we would give, if we would have ears to hear, that the man who sleeps at the back of the boat isn't just an interesting man. He's not just a good man. He's not just a powerful and extraordinary man. He's the God man. He's God in human flesh. He's the creator dwelling in the midst of his creation and he alone has power over the storm. Why should we trust Jesus in the middle of the storm? Because he has power over the storm. He's not like us. He's not weak and defenseless and hopeless. He is God Almighty. We should trust him because of his presence with us. That is, his power isn't purposeless. He has power and he is with us in his presence. That is, he loves and cares for us. We should trust him because of his plan for the storm. That his power is not purposeless, nor are his plans. It's not an accident. We should trust him. Let me close by giving you two observations from this passage. Number one, And for those of you that are familiar with the Bible and familiar with the gospel story, you should have hopefully noticed this. This account of Jesus calming the storm is a wonderful illustration of the gospel, isn't it? There we were, just like the disciples, lost, hopeless, defenseless, no power found within us at all, powerless to stop the storm, powerless to get out of the storm, and that storm is sin. There we were, just like them. No hope can be found. Nowhere we can turn. Nothing we can do. Paul describes us in his letter to the Ephesians as dead in our trespasses and sins. Pretty hopeless. Pretty bleak. And there is no hope if we look to ourselves, if we trust in ourselves. We die in the storm if we look to ourselves. But if we look to the cross, we see a crucified savior. We see the lamb of God buried and risen to life three days later, conquering sin and death, holding power over top of our very enemy, that very storm that would rage inside of us. Death no longer holds a power over him. He holds absolute power over it. And how do we avoid the sting of death? How do we escape that storm? What must we do to be saved? We must cry out to him. We must see our absolute need of him and turn to nowhere else, turn to no one else but to him. Lord, save us. Lord, help me. And when we do that, we find Jesus not just willing to save, but sufficient to save because he has power to save. We must come to Christ to have our sins forgiven because only in him can that storm of sin be stilled in our lives. But what of the storms in this life? Will life be easy once we've gone to Christ and he has dealt with that storm of sin? This is the second thing 
I'd like to offer to you. The second reminder, and it's this, that God is not obligated to take away the storms of this life. Yes, he can easily silence those storms. He can easily take away all that would crash down upon us. But God hasn't given us any promise that life would be easy. Smooth sailing, if you will. Sometimes we make the assumption, the same assumption as the disciples, that God doesn't care about us. That he's forgotten about us or abandoned us. That he's fallen asleep. That he no longer pays attention to us. We think that if God truly cared, he would have done something about the storm. He would have taken it away from us if he truly loved us, if he truly cared. The Bible teaches us that we will all go through storms of one kind or another. Some more painful than others. We will all experience trials and tribulations. In fact, the Bible tells us we should expect the waves to come crashing down on us. Paul, sorry, Peter writes to the church in his letter, beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial. Don't be surprised when that hurtful, painful thing comes upon you to test you. Don't be shocked when the wave hits you. Why do we go through trials? Why doesn't the Lord take them away? Why does he allow us to go through these storms? It's not because he doesn't care. And it's not because he's indifferent towards the suffering of his people. We go through those moments of doubt and despair, not because they're an accident. We don't experience that feeling of hopeless powerlessness because God has fallen asleep at the wheel. We need to remember in those moments that God has a plan for these storms. He's reminding you in that moment of your greatest need Your greatest need is not to have that storm removed. Your greatest need is to see Christ in the middle of that storm and to cling to him. He's reminding you that while you have no power whatsoever, he has all the power in the world and all the power above the world. What's more, he's reminding you that he's with you in that moment. He's reminding you that you are not alone in the middle of that storm. He's there with you to comfort and protect you. Terry Stoffer was the father of Emily and Josh, still is. He's still living as far as I know. And in response to losing two of his children, he wrote this. It is a hard providence but we are leaning into God's goodness. Where else can we go? It's not that he didn't believe that before, but in the middle of that storm, he realized that he had nowhere else to go but to God. The storm will be over one day. One day there will be perfect peace and rest One day he will wipe away every tear from every child's eye that belongs to him. We must trust him. We must hold on to him. We must cling to him for dear life in the middle of that storm until that day comes. So will you trust him? Let's pray. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, in the fury of the storm, when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn, in the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, while the tempest rages on, when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won, deeper still then goes the anchor, though I justly stand accused, I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ, the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief, hopeless, somehow, O my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary, This my ballast of assurance. See his love forever proved. I will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. 
Christ the sure and steady anchor as we face the wave of death. When these trials give way to glory and we draw our final breath, we will cross that great horizon, clouds behind and life secured, and the calm will be the better for the storms that we endured. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true. We will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. Father, this is our prayer this morning. Teach us to hold on to you. In Jesus' name, amen. stand with us as we sing one more time. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i hold my hope is only jesus Oh, 
Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Oh, the glory evermore to win. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ. Shall repeat yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. All glory be to Christ our King. Christ our Savior, we give you all the glory today. We give you glory because even though life may be chaotic, even though we know it will be chaotic, we have great hope. We have a great rest because of your power and presence and plan for us in the midst of it all. And so we ask that you would teach us, help us in the middle of the storms of life to lean on you more and more. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.